build a classify them into plenty of features and uh, and permutations and and create some risk metrics leading to around 1200 plus events that are either incidents or precursors or even accidents. Every event contains some general information, like the description of the, of the event, what happened, what's the type of the reactor, the date, uh, that what were the affected systems in general. And as well, we assign some score on the ENIS metric. ENIS is the International Nuclear Event Scale that's used usually by IAEA. But that, the ENIS score typically is, is the also covered radiation related events. Why do you focus on the core damage events? So we created our own variant of this ENIS score where we, the focus was core damage events. So the ENIS score goes from 0 to 7, as you know, 0 being uh, not so important for safety and 7 being major accidents like the one that I mentioned. We classified events based on their origin, whether it happened in the nuclear island, in the secondary island, or in the external part, depending on the operating mode of the reactor. Was it in full power or stable power? Was it in shutdown mode or was it in transitory state, ramping up in power or, or getting down? And the number of units affected. So are we talking about multi-unit sites? And in case of multi-unit sites, we're talking about single units or multiple units affected. We further created some failure sequences, like we started by the prior or trigger and shaped in the event, then the systems affected, uh, to what degree were they affected, the severity of the effect, and the contributing factors. Contributors are not exactly root causes. Or the factors that contributed to the failure of the event, so they are not mutually exclusive and they can come multiple of them together to get a certain system. This means kind of an event tree for those of you who are familiar with the term of event tree. So, here, okay, this information, general information, what comes here, it's very similar to event tree in the visualization manner. You see the prior, the initiating event, and we even classify the failures temporally. So, you can see here what systems fail together simultaneously. This really developed for those of you who are familiar with term common cause failure, or they were failed, or they have failed sequentially. To make the database more user friendly and accessible, we created the user interface uh, where, where the user can search based on several metrics like the IMPS statistics, the plans, the type of the plan, the age of the plan at which the event happened, and then shaping the event types were involved, the systems that failed, the countries, and then the user can extract the information they want. To their own database or Excel and then run the automated statistics which they have implemented. To give general uh, feeling of applying on the database, uh, we started plotting the events rate per reactor here. You can see that North America dominates uh, thanks to the US open policy that all events are available for the public. So the US dominates the major share of the events, followed by Western Europe and then Asian countries. So we plotted the uh, the reactor technology, so basically we classified events based on the reactor technology. You see that PWR and DWR are at the very center level. Again, everything is normalized by reactor here, so I will cover the center a bit. And then we can see heavy water and the uh, operating reactor. We wanted to study common cause failures in those events. So, common cause failures are those, are those failures that can happen and cause a failure of two redundant systems at the same time, or two redundant trains at the same time. Uh, we realized there's more around 120 acute and 90 potential, potential like they had the chance to fail, so in a common cause manner. Uh, we reported them based on their contributors that caused these common cause. We realized that the dominating contributors were design residuals. Design residuals are, again, part of the contributors that we have assigned, are when you have a problem that is there by design. So the manufacturer supplied you with a pump or a saw that has some defect, and then you realize it wasn't demanded. Only tested or in certain conditions to fail. So that's not the problem of your testing. I mean, it was more a problem in design. It was either there when you purchase it or even since you the best project there. Other may, uh, and, and the reason, I mean, you can expect why these are uh, dominating because it makes a lot of sense that when you purchase a pump from this manufacturer or supplier, you could purchase the redundant pump as well from the same one. So if there's a defect in one, it's very likely to have a defect in other. Testing and maintenance errors, what are these? These are errors caused. That caused the failure of the system because of the testing and maintenance team. So you send the testing and maintenance team to do some to perform some testing or, or, or on a certain train or pump. They do their work and they might forget to follow close after they, for example, tested the pump and they leave. And then when that pump or train was demanded, they realize, oh, the bulb was closed, it was supposed to be open. So these are examples of testing and maintenance errors. And the reason why they are also important contributors to common cause is that you can imagine. You, it's very likely that you will send the same testing and maintenance team following the same procedures to the same trains. 
some countries do not do that, and it's part of the foundation of the Yeah, they are. I mean, so a huge and potential, a huge or real false failures, potential are failures that because of that could have the chance to post some. Uh, well, the potential that uh, how, how do you know that success is going to be Yes. So, so that's usually it's, it's very common to have that in the record and they say, okay, this event, for example, was at this uh, was from the same supplier, but the same company, but luckily it didn't fail. So that's not So single versus multi units, multi units events, so events that occur at multi units are very likely to be affected, so to be triggered by external triggers, as you can see. 66% of the events happening at multi units or causing multi units issues come from external origin. Unlike when the event is affecting a single unit, it's usually from a nuclear or secondary element. That's been a bad moment. And we also, when we started studying the contributors, we also realized that design residuals are the main nominators for the multi unit failures. So, again, if you have multiple units on one side, it's very likely that we'll have the same supplier supplying the same equipment and this error is propagating from the to another. Another interesting, uh, another dominating factor is procedures. Procedures are common in place than others. Sometimes the procedures are not really good in this condition, or they didn't realize until the condition occurred that the procedure was missing something, as well as testing and maintenance. We wanted to study as well to have a feeling about the appearance rate of events over the years. Do we see any clustering behavior? Do we see anything? So we plotted the events appearance rate normalized by the reactor, by the number of reactors operating in our database. So as you can imagine, this right side is the number of reactors in our database, not the overall, because we sometimes couldn't get the information about those reactors or events from those reactors. So just to be fair, we included events, uh, we included the reactor count for the events that we have in the database, not for the estimate. And we started plotting the count of events with their Poisson error bar, assuming they follow Poisson distribution independent correlation over time. So we can see that the, there is a certain clustering in the early period, color green and yellow, where we see that the appearance rate, the left axis, uh, is higher than the others. So this is for those of you familiar with the reliability, with the reliability theory, it's called infant mortality, right? In the early days, you have a lot of issues, you learn a lot, you will face a lot of problems. So this explains why we have this higher rate, as well as another reason for having higher error bars is that in the early days, you have less number of reactors, so the variance is really high. We further realize that as well as following, following major accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima, there is a sudden small shift. You can see some signal and sudden jump in the rate, uh, rate of events that we have. And this could be explained by the fact that yes, following major accidents, you have a lot of a realization of latent errors. Okay, this accident has occurred there, was due to this problem. Let's see if it could occur here, and they realize latent problems are potentially due to this. As well as we could relate that to some alertness or anterior alertness of some plants, because that's why it lasts only for a few years, five and six years, and beyond that, there's a memory effect. We also see some count periods. So, following that period, periods of accidents, we see a count period, the rate of events occur, which could reflect or mainly reflect the fact that. Retrofits are taking place. The rate of accidents increases really to increase after a few years. Third, as I said, it's the rate period explained by the accidents. We also wanted to study if there are any signals for aging. So, do we see any? And um, here we, we took the appearance rate as the proxy for aging. So, we sorted events, we took events that are purely based on technical failures. So, there are many events which were caused by human failures, not by human failures. So we, we didn't take these, we only took events that have technical basis. I wanted to study now the events of parents per actor, per actor, per actor so the rate versus the actor age. So we go to wherever, yeah. So, so yeah, to normalize, we, we plotted the number of reactors uh, operating beyond that age. So it's like, what's the life is the likelihood measure of, what's the likelihood of a reactor occurring beyond the age of 20, 30, 20, 30, 40, 50. So you can imagine beyond a certain age, there is no more reactors existing by that. And as I said, we plotted them to the reactor age. And we realized that there is some kind of an inflection point here. With more data, probably better signals can be inferred. But it's kind of an inflection point is occurring around the age of 25. Further statistics and uh, uh, results and new analyses can be found in our two publications in the rest of the engineering.
Again, we were interested in, we go back to the early, early slides, to PRAs, PSAs, right? We wanted to see if the data supports the fact that we can go generic to PRA, and we wanted to go to these generic PRAs to quantify our effects from a risk point of view. So, based on the lessons learned from the database, we realized that we could go somehow generic to build some generic PRAs that are good at capturing major failures in different plants. So, generic doesn't mean that it covers all types of technologies. Within the same technology, we have a common, a common PRA. So, for pressurized water reactors, or boiling water reactors, we utilize the same uh, PRA with a certain room for customization depending on the available system. For example, some plants have high pressure recirculation, others do not. Some plants might have, uh, depending on level of redundancy, might have three times 100 percent, others might have four times 50 percent redundancy, and so on. Power supplies and how the support connected, these are factors that we can uh, account for, and the level of human interference. So the events are quantified with the devoted fault trees as well. They are generic uh, and modular in the sense that we can zoom in and, and uh, insert the numbers. We accounted for common cause failures. We imported as well, as I've seen in our database, as well as the literature we realized the human risk. So we account for common cause failures at two levels, at a plant level, in which the failure can cause technological appearance and cause failure in cross systems, like inter systems, different systems, or, or, or local level where the failure can cause uh, can cause failures within the same system, so redundant. But total loss of support, the model as an initiator on its own, and partial support failures are also important uh, determining factors. Our model again at two levels local and global. Local means a failure within the same system, global means inter system. Human contributors were also accounted for. Testing and maintenance errors, as we realized, are very important in our database. We included errors of omission. Omission means the operator was supposed to do something and they didn't. But errors of commission where the operator was uh, wasn't supposed to do something I committed the problem field. Considered initiators, here are the list of considered initiating events, generally transients, complicated transients, some specificity for pressurized water reactor, and steam line breaks or steam generated tube ruptures, loss of coolant accidents with different sizes, as well as loss of support functions, loss of power, or loss of uh, components. For quantification, we use the UX 692H for, for aggregating the, the, the failures on the train level. For human errors, uh, for human failures, we, we try to use generic estimates from the after from the old days, as well as some estimates from our database for common cause failures and newly introduced factors like testing and maintenance errors. We accounted for uncertainties in the dominating factors, so we used some risk measures, so our importance measures like the crystal density or burn down importance. To check what are the most important factors to account for the uncertainties to minimize the computational cost. And due to the fact the models are really uh, like user friendly, the user can always zoom in and check the, 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 the fault tree or the basic event they are interested in, and they can zoom in and insert the response to the This is an example of an intermediate complexity small break lookup. So you can see the initiator, the secondary side pooling, the high and low pressure estimates. To Coolant inventory and PMD. Uh, 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 when you zoom into, for example, high pressure injection, you see the contributors of the trains, common cause failures, and recovery potentials. When you zoom in within a train, you see the further contributors, human factors, technical, and support. This is an estimate just trying for a generic PWR, Westinghouse design. We try to Around the nominal case, and we realize that it has other estimates that are P minus five, which fits well in the similar uh, in the plant specific estimates. So it's exactly in the same order of magnitude. Yes. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the core damage frequency. That's frequency. That's from the PR. These are the results of running the PRA, for example, for Westinghouse. Uh, Bonds, we are. Uncertainty bonds, but we have accounted for many uncertainties. What is your cutoff? I mean, those are uh, those plants you put there are, are not plants that have really serious accidents. How much the cutoff for inclusion for including events? What about the cutoff for the include for including the events? Yeah. So in general, a precursor by definition is something that has a, a Conditional core damage probability higher than 10 power minus 6. 
So there is this quantitative criteria and there are qualitative criteria, which are usually used in the, in the regulatory bodies for precursor uh, program. Uh, the qualitative uh, criteria that they use before they assess it is that does include a complicated sensing or just general sensing, that does not include a failure in multiple trains within multiple systems, that does affect the redundancy of that system for an extended period of time. So there are qualitative criteria we also took into account before including these events. Furthermore, we included events that we saw that they are that they have some safety relevance or some lessons we could learn from them. So there's both quantitative and qualitative criteria. Okay, so you're, you're looking at potential accidents. Exactly. Like they are numerous. Like they are not numerous. Yes. So they are precursors to an accident. An accident didn't exactly happen, but could have happened conditional on the appearance of other phases. Sure. So what's a precursor analysis? I mentioned the term precursor several times. It's a hybrid statistical and probabilistic approach to map an empirical event, an instance that we have in a database, for example. So it's theoretical model. So we want to see the chain of events that occur in reality in their PRA, first to study their coverage as well as to quantify the risk. So how do we do the analysis? So if the event involves an initiating event, an initiator, you go and look at the, at the event tree, and then you go for it. Okay, if that was an initiator, or for example, a small break token. You go to the event tree and you turn the frequency of small break token to the probability of one. It has happened. And then when you run your PRA, it will directly calculate for you for that event tree the conditional for that probability. Conditional on the occurrence of this event, what is the probability of that? That's the question we are, we, we are aiming for. Another type of, uh, of uh, precursors could be what? Not there is no engagement of an initiating event, but there is a degradation in some system. There is a failure in some system. And how do we quantify that? We go to the affected, to the affected system in small tree. We check what trains, for example, failed. Let's say there was a train that has failed. Um, did that has common cause failure? So did that, did that event uh, account for common cause? Or does it have a common cause potential? If it does, then it's one. It's not, but has the potential. This is modified. And then running the PRA for all events now, for all the event trees, while changing the default tree, will produce the conditional coordinate frequency, right? Because we still have frequencies of initiating. So now we want to calculate probabilities, right? Conditional coordinates probabilities. We can calculate that knowing the time of exposure, again, using the Poisson formula. We know the time of exposure of the failure of the system or that train. We can calculate conditional coordinates probabilities. And then we want to see the increment, right? What is the nominal coordinates probability and what's the jump? What's the increase to that failure? So we just calculate, so just quantify the increment, and that will be the risk and the You can ask. If there is an initiator as well as the failure in the system, what do we do? It's just a superposition of both, right? We change the event tree if the initiating event is event tree, as well as we change the system for probability of the system. For further details about ordinary modes, uh, can refer to other presentations on them. And then Finally, we wanted to study risk, right? We want us to do some comprehensive risk assessment based on both the hybrid approach. Huh? Statistics as well as the RH to complement the statistics. How do you do that? That metric of the difference in the average between the two prioritize vulnerable elements? Can you say that? Yeah. Um, do you end up using that metric to prioritize vulnerable elements? Uh, no, the metric was more to, to, to give a risk measure of the event itself. So, or or failure in the system. So you can tell, yeah, I mean, you can see that the if, if this failure in that system created a high delta C, CDP, this means it's very, very, that it can contribute more to the risk. You can, it's different than the way that Russell Leslie, for example, for this kind of looked at the event and how many times of the cup test appeared, for example. This is more on what's the contribution, what's the share to core, core damage. That's how it can be visual. So knowing that this, sorry, knowing conditional on the appearance of that failure, what's the probability of that? And then this has been used decision-making? This can be used in decision-making to monitor, for example, the dance performance over time, right? What's the, 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 the integral uh, core damage probability over the time, for example, uh, and you can integrate that over the year. So we see a trend going down. We can divide, for example, the parent core damage probabilities in that year and the empirical core damage probabilities. That would something related to that, and then I'm happy to ask that. Are there any other questions for the previous part? Good.
critical. All right, so here we wanted to do some comprehensive risk assessment based on fusing now the database, the PRAs, and the precursor analysis applied on these events. So the first thing we started by doing, if you remember when I started this in score event, this qualitative risk analysis, these were for all the events in our database, regardless of the technology, right? And we plotted, we calculated their, we assigned their in standard. And we want to plot the severity curve, the frequency of occurrence versus the in score, right? Like the farmer scale for those who are familiar with this. And we plotted that in a log, linear scale. Remember, in this kind of just like a logarithmic scale, it's like 37. Every jump in this is like 10 times more severe. So that's in a log linear in this scale. And it should, so for zero and one events, we can see a statistical censorship. Why? Because uh, remember, we said that our database cares more about serious events. So events of in zero and one are not that important. That's why they really fall below what they are supposed to, right? They can be in two or fine. This is, is explained by just the fact that our database scopes our more serious events. While for all the other events, like in this two and above, which we try to our best to include them, they really fit on a very good straight line in a log linear scale, explaining that they are followed, they follow an exponential distribution in a log linear scale. So if you want to think of it in a log, log scale, you take that back at 10 power. This is a power log distribution, right? The other interesting observation is that in this four and five events, in this four means that there's a localized core damage, there's fuel damage in a certain area, and in this five is that there is a core melt of three mile island if you live there, are well captured by the model. However, in the seven events, like the well-known major accidents of Fukushima and Chernobyl, they evolve the they evolve our 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 tail of distribution. Resembling the facts of the dragon king theory, for those of you who are familiar, otherwise, I'll just mention it. We wanted also to study based on the precursor assessments uh, for light water reactors, pressurized and boiling water reactors. We have around 900 events. We wanted to see if there was, and this one, we want to study the risk profile as well. We wanted to study if there was any shift in the risk profile post Three Mile Island. We know that Three Mile Island caused a lot of retrofits in the industry. Hundreds of billions of dollars were invested to retrofit the existing fleets. So, did that cause a shift in the risk profile? Can we see a shift in the, in the shape of the risk curve? So, we plotted the three and off the MI in black and, uh, and uh, gray. We plotted the complementary competitive distribution function on the y axis and the risk measures conditional core damage probability or the, or the core damage probability. In the, the first thing we realized also, again, we want a certain cutoff, so we are more interested. We realize that distributions follow a very interesting log straight line in the log log scale, meaning that they follow the, the Pareto distribution, the power law distribution of this shape, the variety of a minimum severity threshold value of the power minus value. Furthermore, we realize that the tail, sorry, the slopes are less than one. And what does that mean in a Pareto distribution? This means that the risk is uh, that this means that the, the distribution has infinity in right? Since our risk measure is a probability, there is no infinite value for that. This means that our risk is really dominated by extremes. There are extreme values dominating the whole risk profile and contributing to shifting the whole profile. Furthermore, we realize that for post for post three mile alignment, the slopes are higher. What does that mean? That yes, there is a, a certain shift in the risk profile. We see that the, the risk that the risk or the severity shifts left, and this means that our uh, integral will go down. However, that's on the catch. The catch that for larger CDF, then again, we see that the gray dots for plus TMI resemble again the profile of three TMI. So something is going on at the height of the extreme. So the two distributions become indistinguishable. And what is that? There is a very interesting observation in public system that says obsessive control sometimes can backfire. So when you try to suppress small events, the frequency of small events, this can come out and fire back and generate bigger events that you didn't anticipate. That's an empirical observation which we have also realized that it's happening here. And this resembles again the theory of dragon kings. What are dragons and what are the kings? This is a typical term used in the field of prediction, actuarial sciences. This theory leads to so dragon is that because they are born of unique origins. So they have they are different than their colleagues, for example, and they have this along similarity in common, these extreme events. And kings is that because they are really major, they are really high, they have the highest severity. However, the birth of dragon kings, so the birth of dragon kings, have a lot of interesting uh, predictability attributes. For further details, I refer to Professor Solomon's presentation on that. And we realize that all these extremes are in reality following what the dragon king theory says. They are all born from unique origins. 
They are all born from external endogenous factors. These events include the Fukushima Tohoku earthquake events, so the Yumi and the Ichi events. They include the Armenian fire in the 80s, and they include, for example, the Russian uh, Kola tornado in the 90s. So they are all born from that origin. Finally, to estimate risk on, on that purely on, on that hybrid uh, using that hybrid approach, so this is probably coming back to the point of estimating for dynamic frequency. Using the law of total probability, you can derive that the for dynamic frequency can be estimated as one over t, t is the whole operation of reactor here of all reactors, so all the cases, for example, here included in my total reactors, uh, um, and then multiplied by the sum of the compositional probabilities that we have calculated by this. Like that's the CCDP, the probability of a core damage, knowing that that precursor of the I of it. And we somehow, uh, that, I mean, definitely in low pro total probability, you need infinite number of, uh, of precursors, but, uh, but we want a certain arbitrary large number, this estimate converts very well. And similarly, for larger release frequency, we can estimate that. Our estimates generate that the core damage frequency from pure internal events from, from a statistical point of view is in the order of 90 minus 5. And the larger release frequency is on the order of 90 minus 6. However, when we go and talk to total probabilities, it can affect from both internal and external events. Remember, external and the main is very large. Both estimates are on the order of t minus 4. So something in the order of t minus 4 per reactor. Or an average plant, but not a plant specific, that's for industrial. So, what does that mean? Risk is dominated again by external factors based on these two estimates. The larger release frequency is 95% dominated by external factors, only 5% contribute to this. Also, we wanted to study if there is any temporal behavior, especially post TMI. We saw that there is starting, we have a decrease in, in, in the occurrence of the events, and then the estimates are up to 2010, which are something in the order of T minus 6. But then Fukushima came and the estimates suddenly jumped. So, this is again the estimate of larger release frequency for the exposure period, and then that's the running rate. So up to 1981, 1982, what are the cumulative reactor years uh, sum of operation? I wonder if it's uh, better to treat Fukushima, Fukushima as one of them. It's better to treat as one. Yeah. Uh, it could be. That's a, probably a philosophical. Yes, that's going to shift. Yes. So Fukushima is closer to the right field. You're very right. I mean, this is a good question, but. Uh, there are multiple opinions on that. So there are three core damages and three early. <laughs> yeah, very right. I mean, this can be also uh, correctly calculated. So we can assume that core damages in the world have been five one at CMI, one at Chernobyl, one at Fukushima, or three, one by one by one. Other people, I mean, we have that estimate also in the paper. We calculated core damage per size. So that we know what, what that, uh, that uh, hard uh, philosophical question, whether it's small or three. So we said, what's the core damage probability per size? Rather than per unit, and then we try to come in the picture. So you're very right. <laughs> For further details, you can refer to our not yet published nature and energy paper. Oh. So that we've been talking a lot about events, events, accidents, precursors, bad news. Well, there are always opportunities to learn. Well, on a tangential line of research, we've been working on accidents and and uh, heavy industry, right? We've been trying to we analyze accidents in different heavy industries, not only nuclear, to try to study their appearances, like case studies of your study, case studies of 20 major disasters along uh, across different uh, industries, like oil and gas, chemical, metallurgy, mining, aviation, and uh, nuclear and hydro and mining engine. And we try to suggest real practical solutions. So these books are very less quantitative, they are more on the managerial level. So here we try to leverage the opinion of 100 top managers around the world managing critical industries and uh, based on their experience of operation as well as based on the lessons we've learned from analyzing the 20 major disasters. Uh, this book is expected to be published in a month or two, I think that this is going to be number 22. This brings me to the end. I really thank you for your attention. I think I was in time for five minutes and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. The source of data for the type of reactors as well, and what kind of failure. So, which one is safer? We have about two dozen dollars of data. Uh, and which one is so showing data that, that would be a better choice? Better safer, better. Yeah, 
know, we don't have operational data yet. Yeah, but I, I look forward. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, I don't know. Right? There has to be one, and there has to be. <laughs> so, so the bad news is that we realize that oil and water and specialized water rights have a very similar rate of events of their phenomena. So I cannot declare what's what's safe from from pure from that point of view as well. So if you went to spot the current says PW and PW, PW is basically just earlier, right? So whatever happened earlier, and the PW is later, so could you shift the current paper and get back? Yes, but can you shift it? Um it's not automated, but can you tell me? I didn't do that. I didn't do that. It could be a, a good thing to study. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, right? If you say it started off working later, it means that it has learned a lot. So we have to penalize. Does that this is a well, question that could be wrong about, right? So that's 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 to show that. Right? Yeah. That's the same learning for it that you can argue that you didn't learn. Yes. Sodium rare car is the most sodium rare below the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but this could be done. This this does this is ten years. I didn't do it, but uh, it's an opportunity. Yeah. That would be interesting to see South Sodium as a catalyst. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, I would argue or assume that let's say how the the lander they have their own system. Uh, do you have access to that and can you compare your data to theirs? So in terms of the analysis database of the cursors, we're pretty condensed. I've been involved in the uh, PSADA, Progressive Safety Assessment Event Analysis Task Force, that's the international one, where every year we meet like all precursor analysts from different countries and we compare precursor that have occurred by our field exchanges with our people. And they are really transparent, so they share literally all the events. So we're covering, I would say, 90% plus of the US. Some precursors we do not include because they don't fit our criteria, but in general, they feel very good. I would assume they have models too, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, it could also be that uh, they report the desktop. So, in fact, I have a note in my uh, one of my applications that this should alone be taken as a proxy for safety. There's a lot of other factors contributing depending on who's reporting, so it could be the lot of censorship. So, the trigger that, that it's a good thing somehow that you have to report more. And uh, yeah, so uh, it's not exactly purely uh, saying that you are safe. Can you say that? Um, the or you're using that power plants on the no, generic We didn't include, I mean, we have a few events, not in the database on research reactors and the military uh, uh, facility part, that wasn't part of the research. I mean, also, the, there you feel, feel I mean, there's a lot more uh, secrecy and then you want to have it. I, I did something a little bit like this several months back, uh, six years ago, seven years ago. So it made me looking at uh, severe accidents uh, and uh, trying to make a, 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 a explanation for some of this. But I got about seven, seven, uh, 7,000 uh, documents that are behind the Would you like to have them? 7,000 documents. Yeah. So I definitely would love to have. <laughs> so, uh, but when I scan that and look at this, uh, when I scan back and look at this, the, what I see when I look back far enough is that most of these events are uh, availability bias. And, and from now I'm in the I'm in over here now, which is slightly so um, so I think all this stuff is good, but I'm trying to wonder how you get beyond the availability bias. Because the availability bias is, says you, know, you can't you can't fix what you don't understand. Yes, so by availability bias, I mean access to events. Yeah. What do you mean that? Yeah. So yeah, I mean we literally strive to get, I mean, as I said, a lot of engagement many, many organizations just to get access to more data. But uh, if we can't get them, we cannot get them down, we still need to do something, right? So I, I once heard from a very good statistician a Turkish was saying that a good statistician is not the one that can do something with plenty of data. A good statistician is the one that can do can infer a lot from, from a little bit, right? So that's what we try to do. So even with the 1000 plus, which is the largest existing database, uh, open database available besides the cursors, uh, that's what we managed to optimally infer. But definitely with more data, uh, there's probably other things that we could uh, we could do. But something about the risk profiles, I mean, one thing that you can do to test if your data is converging or not, we tried to separate, so divide the data. And there were early studies in 2016, we were studying only 100 events, right? And then studying this profile based on 1,000 events, and we didn't see much shift in the slope of the log log cross, which means that our data is really converging to the good estimate for that data we have is very representative. But definitely, having more data is a pleasure. Well, I mean, this is a, it's like, you know, we can kind of go through the picking one by one. Yes. We know this accident, we're not going to do that. Yes. We're going to do this accident, but how can we get a little bit further ahead of it? Uh, and there's the other uh, kind of like stuff on the bridge. Uh, we just had to see that, that, that we tend to forget the laws for bridges. <laughs> I hope it's not the case for us, but it could be. Right. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Can you add, like from the areas that you don't have now there? First, are the types of failures similar to the base who were buried as a result? If that's the case, then can you censor it from the base that you have not created? 
uh, even in the places that there is less water, that there is other incidents that might come out of that they can that they disclose them. Yeah. But can you infer even if you yeah, yeah. Any idea about the type of the failure, but just that uh, there was other failures that they didn't I mean, this requires some um, assumption on stationarity, right? Uh, to say that based on this assumes somehow a, a similar pattern of occurrence rates is happening over the years. Yeah, this requires an assumption. Yeah. We fixed the time. I mean, if we fixed, if we decided to go on with this assumption of stationarity of data, then definitely this would be done. But we cannot because we realize, I mean, I mean, we know that not from nuclear. Well, that's general reliability theory that, for example, occurrence rates of early days would not resemble occurrence rates in the fall of one from years, for example, if that's something like that. And then you will have, for example, an aging behavior. So this is that top curve, you know. So in the early days, there's a high rate, and then there's a kind of constant rate, and then there's a sudden change for that state of data. So this tells us the rate itself is not constant. But again, you cannot divide this, um, you can similarly divide this one occurrence or accident. Yeah. So let's, so let's take a few more time to see how much we can do.